about, I want to talk about the circumstances that the United States and Israel face. Uh, and I will, in the course of doing that, have some criticisms uh, of some of our leaders. But let me be clear that uh, mistakes have been made by uh, American presidents of both parties uh, over a sustained period of time. So the fact that we're uh, in where we are today uh, is, uh, is not uh, due to the, uh, to, to the leadership simply of the current administration. But we are at a place of significant decision making, both for the United States and for Israel. Now, I'm aware, uh, obviously, of the controversies, the disagreements that have existed in recent months over uh, how to do uh, negotiations between uh, Israel and the Palestinian Authority uh, and the discussions leading up to the proximity talks which I think can only be understood as a substantial step backward after thousands of hours of direct negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians to have to revert to proximity talks uh, shows just how difficult uh, times have become. I know obviously the controversies because of the position that uh, the government of the United States has taken with respect to housing construction and the issue of the 67 uh, borders, uh, and, and many, many other issues that are of enormous significance to Israel, uh, and therefore to the United States. I want to talk tonight about the single most important issue that confronts Israel and that I think confronts uh, the United States in the world, and that's the threat of nuclear proliferation specifically in the form of Iran. Now, before I get to that, I want to talk first about North Korea for a minute. I've spent a good part of the last 10 years trying to explain to people that North Korea is a significant Middle Eastern power. Uh, I think now there's a growing awareness of the role North Korea has played and continues to play in contributing to nuclear proliferation in the Middle East and certainly contributing uh, to the growth of ballistic missile technology in the hands of Iran, uh, Syria, formerly Saddam Hussein's Iraq, uh, and other countries. North Korea is fundamentally a criminal state. Uh, it sells drugs in its uh, diplomatic pouches. Uh, if Al-Qaeda could come up with enough hard currency, there's no doubt in my mind that North Korea would be prepared to sell them uh, one of its nuclear weapons. Uh, and there's no doubt that North Korea uh, has been a, a partner with Iran and Syria uh, in developing a nuclear reactor on the banks of the Euphrates River that the Israeli Defense Forces destroyed in September of 2007. This is a... And, and thank goodness they did. This is a demonstration of the reach uh, of the threat posed by Iran. That reactor wasn't financed by Syria. It was undoubtedly financed by Iran. Uh, and both Iran and North Korea had a common interest. If you're trying to hide an illicit nuclear weapons program from prying international eyes, what better place to hide it than in a country nobody is looking? Now, this is the, the attack on that North Korean reactor in September of 2007 was the second time that Israel has destroyed a key element uh, of a nuclear weapons program of a hostile state. The first, of course, being in 1981 when uh, Israel destroyed the Osirak reactor outside of Baghdad. Uh, we are, uh, to be completely blunt, uh, at a point where a decision is going to have to be made in the very near future, in my view, whether uh, to take uh, further uh, preemptive action uh, against a threatening nuclear weapons program. This is a very unattractive choice for Israel to have to face. But it faces that choice, in my view, largely because of a, a sustained failure of policy by the United States both during the Bush administration and the Obama administration, and beginning really even uh, in the 1990s, uh, American policy centered on the theory 
that Iran could be negotiated out of its nuclear weapons program, a program it's now been pursuing for close to 20 years. Uh, diplomats from the United States, working with diplomats from Britain, France, and Germany, uh, wanted to offer Iran a package of carrots and sticks, of incentives and disincentives that would induce Iran uh, to give up its nuclear weapons program in exchange for a closer relationship with the West. This was always the thrust of the negotiations by our European friends, even though the United States did not take part directly. Uh, it has been plain uh, for some time that Iran is never going to be talked out of its nuclear weapons program. So the alternative, looking at the disincentives, the sticks in the package that our diplomats had put together, uh, is now the predominant subject of conversation. But ladies and gentlemen, we have tried the sticks before. The Security Council at the UN has already adopted three sanctions resolutions. The United States has had unilateral sanctions on Iran for decades since the 1979 seizure of our hostages. The sanctions have not worked. Iran has been able to mitigate the effect of the sanctions uh, and compensate for them. So while it might once have been theoretically possible that a well-conceived and thoroughly administered program of sanctions might have stopped Iran uh, from achieving its objective of deliverable nuclear weapons, those days are past. There are a lot of ideas, some uh, being considered in Congress now about uh, further financial sanctions, keeping Iranian financial institutions out of international markets, about sanctions on Iran's importation of refined petroleum products. Uh, these are great ideas whose time has come and gone. Uh, all of these theoretically might have stopped Iran, but not anymore. I think if you look realistically at the circumstances we face, the most likely outcome in uh, the region today is that Iran gets nuclear weapons. Uh, my fear is that the administration uh, believes that as undesirable as that might be, that we can live with a nuclear Iran, that we can contain and deter Iran. I think this, is, uh, this verges on the frivolous. Uh, I don't think that anybody should want their innocent civilian population held hostage to the whims uh, of a fanatical regime such as the one in Tehran. I don't think you can look at facile analogies to deterrence against the Soviet Union during the Cold War and believe that it will work today. The uh, mindsets of the leaders of the Soviet Union, uh, as it was then, and Iran are completely different. Say what you want about the communists in Moscow, they were atheists, and they believed they only went around once in life. Uh, and they weren't about to throw it away too quickly. In Tehran, you have people who prize life in the hereafter more than they prize life on Earth. This is a very difficult group of people to deter. The American view, we're a very diverse country. I've always thought the American view was summed up in the words of the Kenny Chesney uh, country and western song, everybody want to go to heaven, nobody want to go now. <laughs> but that's not a theme that resonates in Tehran today. Uh, and therefore, the notion of deterrence working against Iran uh, is based on a misperception. And even more fundamentally, the entire structure of power in the Middle East changes once Iran gets nuclear weapons. They don't have to use nuclear weapons to have a profound uh, impact. And even if I'm wrong about the possibility of containing and deterring Iran, it doesn't stop with Iran. If Iran gets nuclear weapons, Saudi Arabia will get nuclear we weapons, Egypt will, Turkey will, perhaps others will as well. And so in a very short period of time, five to 10 years, you could have half a dozen countries in the region with nuclear weapons. And if you thought that bipolar uh, nuclear standoff in the Cold War was unstable, imagine the instability inherent in a multipolar nuclear Middle East with uh, several countries with small arsenals of nuclear weapons looking anxiously at uh, the country next door and wondering who is going to strike first. This is why, to me, it is absolutely critical to stop Iran before it gets nuclear weapons in the first instance.
And, and that is why I feel uh, so frustrated uh, at having watched nearly 10 years go by uh, while Iran used the cover of diplomatic negotiations to make continued progress overcoming the enormous scientific and technological difficulties that stood in the way both of its nuclear weapons program and its ballistic missile program. That's why, uh, as I said a moment ago, the most likely outcome today is that Iran gets nuclear weapons. Uh, I don't think diplomacy has any chance of success. I don't think sanctions have any chance of success. That means that the only thing uh, that stands between Iran and nuclear weapons is the preemptive use of military force uh, by some outside power. Now, preemptive military force is a very controversial subject, uh, hotly debated, especially among our friends in Europe. Uh, but I think that uh, the uh, use of preemptive force was best expressed by Franklin Roosevelt uh, when he looked at the threat to supplying Britain uh, before America was attacked at Pearl Harbor, when American ships were at risk of attack by Nazi U-boats. And Roosevelt justified uh, giving American ships the right to fire first by saying, when you see a rattlesnake threatening to strike, you don't wait for it to happen. Uh, I think that was exactly the right metaphor then, and it is exactly the right metaphor today. This, this, is, a, this is a very unpleasant conclusion. Uh, it puts an enormous burden on the state of Israel enormous and unfair. It's extremely risky to contemplate the use of military force. The outcome is not certain. And even if successful, it will not completely resolve the problem uh, of a nuclear Iran. It will uh, stop them from getting weapons for, I think, a, a multi-year period, three, four years, during which a lot else is possible, including what I think the real uh, policy should be, which is regime change in Tehran. But it puts, it puts Israel in a very, very difficult place. And this is where I think uh, Israeli American citizens and all American citizens should begin to lay the groundwork now to uh, understand why Israel has come to that decision, if that's uh, what they decide, and to support Israel after the military strike. I, w I wish we weren't in this place, but I think if we don't appreciate the gravity of the situation we face, we have no chance of achieving what limited possibility there is of preventing Iran from getting nuclear weapons in the first place. Uh, and that's why I think over the next several months, it's going to be extremely important to make the case publicly that if Israel uh, does use military force, it will not be precipitate or disproportionate, that it will be Israel acting in its legitimate interest of self-defense, and that that attack will also be in the interest of the United States. It, it doesn't bring me any pleasure to have to uh, give you this message. I'm sure it doesn't give you any pleasure to receive it. But I think if there's one thing that uh, Israelis and Americans have in common, many things, but one thing in particular, it's an absolutely clear-eyed realism when it comes to threats to national security. And that's what we need today. We need it here, and we need it in Washington in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.